can we break out of the range set in 2019? Joining us from New York are Colin Martin of Charles Schwab and Peter Cheer of Academy Securities and from Pasadena, John Bellows of Western Asset Management. I want to get your 10-year forecast from each of you for 2020. Colin, I'll start with you. We think the 10-year Treasury yield will rise modestly in 2020. We think somewhere in the two and a quarter range, maybe as high as two and a half percent. Uh, we do think short-term rates are going to stay anchored. We think the Fed's on hold, but we think with signs of uh, stabilization across the global economy, as well as here in the U.S., and maybe some sort of pickup in inflation expectations, we think we can get close to that two and a quarter area for the 10-year Treasury. Peter, your take on the 10-year in 2020? You know, I think we're going to see 225. I actually think it's something we could see as soon as January or February. So I think we're going to start the year off a little bit rough for Treasuries, higher yields, steeper curves as global growth starts to get it priced in, and a little bit of fiscal stimulus out of Europe. And John, your thoughts? You know, the better growth optimism that was mentioned is an argument for higher yields, but I guess I'd highlight two other components of the outlook. The first is that inflation continues to be very subdued. 2019 was supposed to be a year of higher inflation, and not only did that not happen, but inflation actually moved lower across a whole set of measures. And then the second component is the Fed. I think the Fed has adopted a very asymmetric reaction function here. I think they're unlikely to raise rates uh, given the low inflationary environment. And I think there's some chance that they cut rates, whether that's in response to a growth downturn, um, which would be a very straightforward reason to cut, or even if inflation is too weak, there's some chance they cut there. So, you know, growth optimism reason for higher yields, but against that subdued inflation, an asymmetric and accommodative Fed, you know, our view is gonna, those two things will matter more and keep yields quite low for the foreseeable future. So, Colin, I want to talk a little bit about the Fed uh, because John brought it up. You know, the WIRP function on the Bloomberg shows really no movement in either direction really in the first half of the year. I know it's far out, but what's your take on Fed action, at least in the first half of 2020? Well, in the first half of 2020, we think they'll be on hold. You know, we like to say we think they'll be on hold for the foreseeable future. That's what the markets are pricing in, and that's really what Fed officials are telling us. Um, with the three cuts that they did this year, uh, they've successfully uninverted the yield curve. And now things are okay. Financial conditions remain easy. And barring some sort of major change in the economic outlook or maybe some sort of uh, risk-off environment uh, where we see stocks fall, we, we think they're going to be on hold. Peter, I want to take, get your take on now that the phase one of the trade deal has been sort of resolved. What do you need to see in the economic data in the trade tensions to get the Fed to move really in either direction? You know, I don't think the Fed's going to do anything in rates unless there is a big, you know, change in sentiment, either, you know, very positive or very negative. I do think that we might start seeing as early as January them starting to contain how big the balance sheet's going to be, right? A lot of this current rally in equity started in late September, October, when they started regrowing the balance sheet. It looks like we're going to make it through year end without any problems in the short-term funding market. Repo's working smoothly. So I think in January they might start setting expectations saying, hey, we can't keep growing this balance sheet at this pace. And I think that'll be a headwind more on on stocks, I think it'll be okay for rates markets. I want to pivot from the Fed back into the steepening yield curve because that steepening yield curve is bringing some optimism uh, to, uh, to a lot of the markets here. Take a listen uh, to what Morgan Stanley Investment Management, Michael Kushma, is saying that it's a step in the right direction. I take a big confidence from the steepening of the yield curve. I think that is a measure of success, of confidence about the future, the more the yield curve steepens. Because now we're talking about you know, an endogenous rise in long-term rates. It's not the Fed pushing them higher. It's the market pushing them higher because they're more optimistic about the future. Uh, but James Athey of Aberdeen giving a little bit of a different take. Here's what he had to say. You don't get a recession when the curve inverts. You get the recession when the curve re-steepens after it's inverted. There because we are. That's essentially when the central bank has to come in, start cutting rates to ease policy, to deal with the problems which have built up during the expansion phase of the cycle. So essentially, if I were to look at the curve today, I'd say that this is classic pre-recessionary um, uh, yield, yield curve behavior. John, your take on a very, very steep yield curve at this moment, steepest since 2018. Well, first, I do think the re-steepening of the yield curve, the Fed deserves a little bit of credit there. At the beginning of, of 2019, the yield curve was inverted, sending a very clear signal that short rates were too high, mon monetary conditions too tight, and the Fed's cuts have addressed that to some degree. However, I think it's very premature to, to signal an all-clear here to declare success. You know, if you think about the level of yields right now, 
inflation break evens at the 10 year point are 175. That's, that's notably below the Fed's 2% mandate. It's below where we were six months ago, and it's a, a lot below where we were 18 months ago. So, you know, the, the yield curve is not inverted, and I think that Fed deserves some credit. But we're a long ways from an all clear. And I, I think the level of inflation break evens is still worrisome and still demands some attention from the Fed. Well, Peter, we're showing a chart there of the Fed's balance sheet, and you were highlighting this, really, the, the um, togetherness sort of of the Fed's actions and the balance sheet, and then we tie in the steepening yield curve. Is the steepening yield curve, in your opinion, different this time around? It's a good sign given that rates are rising on the long end versus the last time we saw a steepening of the yield curve and then it eventually leads to a recession is because it's really bets on the short end of the curve. You know, I first want to take one step back. In August is when we kind of got this inversion. And I think there were a lot of technical factors at play. There were a bunch of inflows into passive funds. There were a bunch of inflows into long-dated treasuries. There was a, you know, kind of a shortage of sellers. People were getting stopped out. So some of that flattening, I think, was purely technical. We reversed that. The things that I like going forward, I think, that, you know, we wrote back in August that steepening the yield curve should be the Fed and Treasury Department's job, number one. I think the Fed has done a lot for that. What I'm looking for is now whether the Treasury Department will start issuing more duration. This Treasury Treasury, for some reason, is really focused on issuing a lot of T-bills and front-end bonds. They haven't issued as many 10s and 30s, so our balance sheet's a little bit skewed to the front end. I would like to see them come out, start talking about later next year issuing more 10-year, more 30, maybe introducing a 20-year, flooding the market with duration to keep that steepening, because I think steeper yield curves really gives a lot of comfort and it can help the economy. It's kind of the other way around, right? It's really the yield curve leads the discussion rather than the discussion leads the yield curve. Colin, do you agree? Are you more comforted, comforted by the steepening of the yield curve? This time is different with the re-steepening after the initial inversion. Well, we are, we are comforted by this. You know, I'll agree with John where the Fed, this is a success. They lowered rates and they got the yield curve out of negative territory. I do think it's important to put it into perspective. It's still relatively flat. If you look at the three-month 10-year or the two-year 10-year, you're still only in the 20, 25, 30 basis point range. So when you, you know, pull back and really look at the broad yield curve, it's still a relatively flat trend. But if you look at the past mid-cycle adjustments of the 90s, that was also followed by uh, a steeper yield curve, albeit modestly, and we saw a recession kind of push back and recession expectations push back a little bit. So we do think it's a success, um, but we we need to see a little bit more before we see an, an all clear sign. John, as you looked at 2020, is the pain trade higher yields or lower yields? Well, first, if I could just respond to something that Colin said about the, you know, the mm -hmm. mid-cycle adjustments for the 1990s. I think it's really important for investors to understand that this is not the 1990s anymore. The Fed is doing something very different than what they've done in the past. They're not responding to something global. Uh, they're responding to low inflation here in the United States. They've made that very clear. Powell has tied future rate hikes to inflation explicitly. Um, this is not, you know, this is not something that we think is going to be reversed in the next few years. But instead, as long as inflation remains low, the Fed remains on hold. And I think that's really important to emphasize. This is not the 1990s. This is about inflation, um, not something else. In, in terms of the pain trade, you know, one thing that strikes me is when you think about pain trades, they're about what's the consensus. And one consensus trade that we hear over and over again is the steepening of the yield curve, you know, for reasons that have been discussed. And that could very well happen if you do see some kind of reignition, reignition of global growth and optimism and yields move higher in the back end. Um, but I think if inflation did not move higher and, and we didn't see an increase in global optimism, um, then I think the you know, kind of steeping the yield curve would be a pain trade in the sense that the, the consensus is there already and you could see mm -hmm. a flattening a, as a result of that. So first point, this is not the 1990s. Important for investors to understand that. And the second point is I do think that steepening yield curve is somewhat of a consensus trade and that means the risks are flatter from here.